This evening, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to look at an interesting topic, at a topic of importance to me. I am going to show you that it is time that we dispensed with current dinosaur paleontology and that what we looked at instead was a totally new model of looking at the way that dinosaurs evolved. We have been brought up with pictures like this since we were children. They're all wrong. And yet, of course, most of us accepted these views of monstrous beasts prowling around the landscape. Some of the drawings that people saw in books what represented the earliest view, which of course dates from the Victorian times, we know that was wrong. Then we had the towering monster, which we also accept is incorrect, and instead we have had it replaced with nonsense, like the ridiculous idea that dinosaurs were destroyed by an asteroid. No, they weren't. They lived on for at least a third of a million years after the asteroid. There have also been the even more absurd idea. A dinosaur-like T-Rex like this went prancing about angrily and was covered with feathers. T-Rex never had a feather. T-Rex never ran anywhere. T-Rex was nothing like this. We have been in the era of what I call reptile dysfunction, ladies and gentlemen, and this evening we are going to see that idea destroyed forever. Once in a while dinosaurs are seen resting in pools as though taking their weight off. And indeed this great, this famous magazine article from uh, 1953 when I was a little boy is a good example, and yet only one of them is shown resting in water, the stegosaur in the background, the giant sauropod in the far side of the lake, the uh, ankylosaur in the foreground, the rather tubby looking tyrannosaur, even the triceratops, it's not triceratops, it's from the Greek, it is a K, not a C, even the triceratops, they're all shown as being on land. And every thread in this magazine shows dinosaurs as terrestrial beasts. Of course, everyone has always accepted that they are terrestrial, ladies and gentlemen. Look in the encyclopedias, we'll go back to the 1980s and right back to the 1880s. All of them, uh, all of them explain that, of course, dinosaurs were land animals. We know that's what everybody thinks they were. Now, in more recent years, we've had the equally ridiculous idea of dinosaurs being dynamic. This view was launched by a man called Bob Bacher, who wrote a book called The Dinosaur Heresies. I may say that's not quite how you pronounce his name. It is pronounced Bacher. It is Dutch or Hollands. Bacher. No, Bacher. Bacher. Closer. Closer. These pommy bastards just can't get their vowels. Come on, come on, do it again. <laughs> Bacher. It rhymes with rocker. That's what the New York Times said 20 years ago. And who are we to argue with the good gray lady? And ever since that movie came out, it would also rhyme with Fokker. <laughs> <laughs> and, and these are some of the ridiculous cartoons in his book. These were taken seriously by so-called scientific paleontologists. These are cartoons. These are no more like dinosaurs. We've got a, a 15-ton dinosaur pirouetting on its toes on one foot. This is just a myth. It is an observed concatenation of dreams put about by paleontologists with nothing better to do, who knows that the audience aren't going to doubt their words. This is no more like dinosaurs than The Simpsons. It's like a documentary on modern American family life. This is no more like dinosaurs than Spitting Image was a party political broadcast. This is an utter nonsense. And again, you have drawings of this kind, beautiful drawings, showing a massive dinosaur poised on the edge of a lake. Look at this wonderful picture by Raoul Martin from Madrid in, in Spain. He really captures them well, standing on the mud at the edge of a lake. And here, Professor Zing has done a drawing of the biggest dinosaurs of all, standing on the mud at the edge of a lake. It doesn't work. If you stand on the mud at the edge of a lake and you're 30 <laughs> times smaller than a dinosaur, this is what happens. They weren't on the shores of the lake, ladies and gentlemen. They were in the lake. Some ill-informed paleontologist in his room has even written that there is scientific evidence for an absurd travesty of this sort. No, there isn't. No dinosaur ever skipped up the beach. No dinosaur ever acted like this. It is a myth, and it is time the myth was destroyed. Now, here we have an archosaur. To members of the public, it's a prehistoric crocodile. And how is it drawn? Leaping in the air, bounding across the desert like a gazelle. No dinosaur has ever visited a desert. No crocodile has ever bounded across the steppe like this. It is absolute nonsense. It is put about by people willfully distorting simple science. Take a, a still from this frame, and you can see, as any child would tell you, it is a crocodile. 
Of course it never leapt. Of course it never ran. And look at his hind legs. They're the hind legs of a person. Whoever did the drawing couldn't even get the picture right, ladies and gentlemen. And listen to them. Formed by the retreat of an ancient sea, occasionally its shores see the movement of herds of dinosaurs. These are Diplodocus, heading for a nesting site to the south. It is a grim journey for these mighty creatures, and the heat and lack of drinking water weeds out the weaker animals. Firstly, it is not Diplodocus, it is Diplodocus. In scientific terminology, we always stress the penultimate syllable of a generic name. Spirogyra, Chlamydomonas, Diplodocus. Diplodocus is simply a way of making it sound sophisticated, which it isn't. And why is this such a ridiculous and absurd distortion of reality? Well, of course they were walking across, but it wasn't a dried up lake. It still was a lake, which immediately solves how they managed to drag their massive bodies around. It immediately solves why it was that they left shallow footprints. It immediately solves how they managed to support themselves. It immediately solves how they avoided the heat of the sun. And it answers immediately the question of not having drinking water. The chronology was wrong. The findings were right. And look at this. The most common plant eater in this region is the highly social Edmontosaurus. They're the largest duck-billed dinosaur in North America. Louis in the name. If you are a duck, a duck-billed platypus, or a duck-billed dinosaur, you live in water. The duck bill is because you feed on pondweed. Their skeletons have always been found in swampy, uh, what was swampy ground, which is why they're always shown in deer swamps. But they weren't walking in the swamps. They were in water, ladies and gentlemen. And often, people have produced ridiculous notions like this one, an appalling distortion of how dinosaurs were supposed to be in water. Because of the pneumaticity of their bones, Don Henderson produced a report in which he showed that if dinosaurs attempted to go into water ever, they would tip over. He gave his title Tipsy Punters to this paper as a rather offbeat little title, and it's very often been cited, but it's nonsense. He shows the centre of gravity and the centre of buoyancy as being very, very close. And in fact, if the dinosaurs put their heads down so their necks are lying in the water, which I believe they always did, then of course you have enormous changes in the centre of gravity. And if the level of water goes up or down just a matter of centimetres, then you have a reversal of the relative position of the centre of buoyancy. The diagram is wrong, not the dinosaurs, ladies and gentlemen. Often it's said that dinosaurs had to have a big tail to counterbalance their necks. No, they didn't. The mathematics has shown quite clearly that a dinosaur holding up a big heavy tail would need to burn half its metabolic input that it takes in in one day in order to support the tail, and another 50% to support its neck, which of course leaves no energy at all to run the dinosaur. Dinosaurs did not need tails to counterbalance them. We have animals alive today which prove the point. This giraffe has exactly the same proportions as that dinosaur, and they're exactly the same size, and it has a little tiny fly whisk tail. If the giraffe had evolved in water, then it too would have an enormous tail to help it manipulate its way around the world. And that brings us to the question of your turning from side to side as if you're carrying a long ladder and you go around a corner or, or you get a, a heavy supermarket trolley at the end of the aisle. And this superb drawing by John Civic shows a dinosaur. Of course that is all out of proportion. It looks distorted to the naked eye. It could never turn sideways, but if we add the water, then of course at once you can see the dinosaur makes sense. And if it wants to turn in any direction, one way or another, it only has to make a little flick of its tail and it can manoeuvre to its heart's content. The question of your is important. Here we can quantify the way in which, which the downward clutch of gravity is counterbalanced by the upward lift of pneumaticity and the buoyancy of a dinosaur in water. And your is the imponderable. A dinosaur on land would find it quite impossible to turn round. A dinosaur in water by moving its tail, can turn with the greatest of each. Look at this example. Predators like Majungasaurus are especially vulnerable to starvation. Hardy 
Davidson motorcycle. They're great to go in straight lines and crap at going round corners. Of course this dinosaur never existed on the desert. It, the desert was the sand at the bottom of a lake. It lived in water. They all evolved in water. And what about the copulation of dinosaurs? This is something people rarely deal with. Well, in 1986, uh, when Beverly Halston was interviewed for Omni magazine, Ron Elvin came up with this wonderful drawing which just shows how imponderable it was. There's only one museum in the world where you'll see copulating dinosaurs. This is the Jurassic Museum in Asturias in Spain. Look in the picture at how much they're enjoying having a really good copulate. <laughs> um, but of course, it is totally impossible. Look at what the BBC... I can't imagine the sense of the people behind this. Look what they put together for a programme. They rock back on their tails to impress potential mates. With creatures this size, the forces at work during these confrontations are colossal. She responds to his calls first by stamping and then generating very low frequency mating calls. He picks these signals up through the ground and responds by walking close to her, rubbing his body down hers. Mating is a dangerous activity for the female. She is going to have to carry at least an extra 10 tons on her back. My God, she's having a good time. I may say, that there, is a, there is a certain humour, is there not, in showing the back of this Diplodocus armoured with spikes onto which a male is about to land his genitalia and the commentary saying it's a risky business for the female. It's a bloody sight worse for the male. And so why did they become so big? Well, there have been an enormous number of papers published on the reason why dinosaurs became so big. This is the biggest, Argodinosaurus, uh, as you can see from the reconstruction here. It makes no sense at all as an animal on land. I recently went to see the skeleton in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Fernbank Museum. Uh, there it is, and people look at it and say, gosh, isn't it wonderful the way those bones were preserved? It's a gone. Let me overlay for you the only bones they found. The rest are all imaginary, ladies and gentlemen. Those are the only fossils that they ever found of this creature. But look at the papers that have been put forward. People have puzzled over gigantism and why large dinosaurs ever became quite so large for centuries. It is an imponderable matter which nobody has sought successfully to answer. And of course, it is only because they were aquatic. Aquatic creatures, like whales and dinosaurs, can go up to about 100 tonnes. Land creatures can only go up to about 10 tonnes. The largest mammalian carnivore alive today weighs a tonne, a polar bear. They weighed 30 tonnes in the old days because they were aquatic. Now, interestingly enough, here's a paper written by Hone, and Ben Hone was tweeting about this very meeting earlier today. And most of these reasons for gigantism make no sense at all there obviously nonsensical, like uh, extended longevity. No, things don't live longer just because they're bigger. Or a greater range of acceptable foods, whatever is that meant to mean. But the potential for thermal inertia, and that raises an interesting question of the body temperature of dinosaurs. Were they warm-blooded or cold-blooded? Well, of course, the argument that they're cold-blooded is easy to accept. No reptile has ever evolved a system for having warm blood. And the argument that they were cold-blooded is, in scientific terms, irrefutable. On the other hand, dinosaurs did a lot of things that you'd only do if you had warm blood. So there are just as many adherents to the view that dinosaurs were definitely warm-blooded. And there is absolutely no doubt in their minds, whatever, about that fact, even a book about it. And then there's another third who believe the dinosaurs were mesothermic. They weren't one or the other which actually, in zoological terms, makes little sense. And so how can we answer this conundrum? Well, because dinosaurs, no, they didn't just swim occasionally, or they didn't just rest in pools, but because they evolved in an aquatic environment, they were, of course, at the same temperature as the water in which they existed. And what was the temperature of the seawater about that time? Why, well, the same temperature as you have in your blood to this day, ladies. I began to study the way in which science was looking at the spinosaurs. The spinosaurs and one of its English relatives, Baryonyx, they're interesting. And a number of bits of evidence, for example, partly digested fish scales were found in the abdomen, 
suggesting that these dinosaurs ate fish. A later paper came along and said that, yes, they didn't have fins or webbing, so it probably they didn't have an aquatic way of life. Then a paper came along which said, well, they were partially piscivorous, occupied a trophic. This means simply that they ate fish, but it said it in scientific terminology to make the writer look more authoritative and clever than really is. Then we had a, an interesting analysis by CT scans of cavities inside the snouts of Spinosaurus. And it turned out, believe it or not, that these almost certainly represented pressure receptors, exactly like crocodiles and alligators have because they live in the water. When you look at the work of Milner and her colleagues at the Natural History Museum, you see that they concluded that, yes, they lived in coastal habits, but they did not swim. And that was the position until this interesting paper by Amio came out, which actually argued, and I found this most appealing, that examining the isotopes of oxygen within the fossil suggested that possibly it was plausible to say they had a semi-aquatic lifestyle. And so I thought to myself, this is wonderful. I'm beginning now to get some solid evidence. The fact that they don't have webbed feet is neither here nor there. This is a crocodile's feet. You don't have to have webbed feet just because you're an aquatic creature. The idea is... <coughs> so they were going to recreate Spinosaurus and one day at Cambridge somebody said, got to watch the bead next week. They've got your Spinosaurus recreated. The greatest paleontological minds in the world have got together, and this is the dribble they came up with. Spinosaurus was the last and the largest of the fish-eating dinosaurs. It's the perfect hunting opportunity for Spinosaurus. Able to hold its snout in the water because of its high nostrils, it can strike without even seeing its prey. I couldn't believe my eyes, ladies and gentlemen. All the evidence had shown that spinosaurs were certainly aquatic, and yet they still had them as terrestrial dinosaurs just paddling in the water up to their ankles. I thought this has gone beyond a joke. And look at it, it is obviously a crocodilian with a fin. Clearly it lived in the water. No sensible person, no person who knows about zoology could ever doubt the fact. So I thought, well, they still haven't got it right, so I need to write an article. For 50 years I've been studying this, and people kept saying to me, you've got to write on this, old boy. So I published an article in the laboratory news. And I pointed out that, of course, Spinosaurus was a dinosaur that was aquatic. Dinosaurs had to be of aquatic evolutionary status because that is how they got to be so big. That is how their blood temperature was controlled. That is why in some of the species of dinosaurs they've got very long forelimbs and shorter hind limbs. Only the footprints of the forelimbs have been found because of course the hind limbs weren't quite long enough to reach to the bottom of the water. I showed in my article that whichever area of science you looked at, it was clear that this ridiculous status of current paleontology made no sense at all. They were posturing. They were putting forward what we would now call fake news, unchallenged by the public. I showed that, interestingly enough, all dinosaur footprints are about the same depth. If you look at the poor stranded rhino and the elephant that we saw, some of those footprints were a yard deep before they finally succumbed to the clutch of the mud. But to me, it seemed utterly obvious, and my aim was to start a debate. A modest little article, just to start a debate. And the most important conclusion of all for me was this one. That Spinosaurus was an aquatic dinosaur. It lived largely immersed in water. This was a, a great step forward in our understanding. And of course, when the article came out, it attracted a lot of attention and was widely promoted to the great annoyance of paleontologists all around the world. But not amongst the world of paleontologists. They were all very angry and cross about it. And so articles began to appear saying that the whole notion that should, one should even debate it was damaging to science. There was a petition to the BBC signed by paleontologists all around the world demanding they retract an interview with me that they had broadcast. I'm not quite sure where to do that. And these bullying little idiots 
started posting messages all over the web, which simply ridicules me and the idea. No attempt to debate it, ladies and gentlemen. These small-minded, petty, old-fashioned, backward-looking recidivists had nothing better to do than just pour out insults. On and on and on it went. And most interestingly of all, the view is being put about that you were wrong even to consider it. Adam Rutherford, the most spectacularly inept broadcaster I've ever had the misfortune to hear, even said, oh, for fuck's sake, I got an email asking if I was interested in the book. No, no, you mustn't be interested. You mustn't even consider it, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody in this room actually said that of course I was wrong to suggest that the Spenosaurus were aquatic. No, he said, they had crocodile jaws, they were waterside predators that waded in the shadows. He was quite firm about it. They dipped their snout tips in. Don Henderson of Tipsy Punters fame said that it was laughable to suggest it was a clear signal of an aquatic way of life. Well, suddenly my work was brooding away in Chicago and they came out with a paper published in Science concluding, would you believe it, that Spinosaurus was an aquatic dinosaur. And suddenly all the paleontologists thought, oh, right, that's OK. Now, what I found amusing is this. Here's just one blog. It illustrated with a picture showing what Paul Sereno thought spinosaurs were like. Paul Sereno, a vertebrate paleontologist at the University of Chicago. The picture is not a very good one. It's amateurish. It was hastily done. I can say that because it's mine. Uh, if you would like to look back at my article, you will see that it's one of my pictures. So they actually lifted one of my pictures from my early article and used it to promote their plagiarised view of my work. And this is the pathetic reconstruction that Paul Sereno advised on. Look at it, with its ridiculously shrunken little hind legs crawling along on its knuckles as though it's suffering from a severe dietary deficiency. And when they made a television series about it, this is how they showed it. For heaven's sake! I've already ridiculed the BBC, who showed it just up to its ankles in water. Or what do they show? It's still up to its bloody ankles in water. No, it's got a fin. It lives in water. And even now, with my evidence and with Sereno endorsing what I had said, they still couldn't understand it. So I went to see Spinosaurus in Barcelona, and of course, it is a crocodilian. It's got the, the sense organs of a crocodile. It's got everything about it. By the way, these are the only bones they had to work on. They interpolated photographs of a spinosaur that was brought back from Egypt before the First World War and was destroyed by Allied bombing in the Second World War. And from that, they made this reconstruction, which is not a good one. This is my alternative view, which is much better, because this one shows proper hind legs. Their view is wrong because they probably got the hind legs from a different specimen altogether. And I raised its head. That is what a spinosaur was probably like, ladies and gentlemen. And it raises another question. There is a strange feature in the skeleton of a spinosaur. It's called the gastralium. These gastralia are sometimes called belly ribs. There's been a lot of interest in what they might be for. Well, uh, one of the early papers that came out said that they might be concerned with the evolution of unidirectional gas in birds. Uh, there were several other papers came out and articles that explained the gastralium. You find them in Sphenodon, which is a, a lizard in New Zealand from the dinosaur time. You find gastralia also in crocodiles and alligators. And you find them in dinosaurs. And of course, there's much speculation as to what they're there for. Most of them say that they were probably there to help stabilize the chest region. No. The reason that the gastralia was there is to stop the abdomen being compressed by water. They're not far in the water, they're in shallow water. But there may be a quarter of an atmosphere, or half an atmosphere, perhaps five pounds per square inch, pressing on the abdomen. And the gastralium is there to make it easier for them to breathe, because they evolved in water and not on land. So, what about the Cretaceous period? Well, the Cretaceous is widely spoken of as being a time when it was cold, arid, there were freezing nights, there's a great paradox as to how the Cretaceous climate could have worked. According to me, the Cretaceous was different. It, the world was covered with shallow lakes and seas. It was warm and balmy. 
The air was humid and it was ideal for warm-blooded dinosaurs living in water and keeping their blood warm through the water, not through their own internal mechanisms. And indeed, America's leading paleoclimatologist, Bill Hay, said that although paleontologists have rejected Ford's ideas out of hand, nonetheless, he said there was evidence that made us ask how widespread were water surfaces like rivers, lakes and wetlands? How extensive would they have been as habitats? So he and Bob DeConto, another great expert, re-ran the computer models. And they found that with my model of the Cretaceous, where it's wet and warm, not extreme and dry, all their paradoxes vanished. And when I went to stay with Bill at his home in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, I asked him what he thought of the new model that they had now created of the Cretaceous, based on my suppositions and now backed with their computer modelling. Good wine and good documentation. That's the perfect blend. Yeah. It's just wonderful. You it's know? really the final confirmation of my theory, isn't it? Yeah. It's more than that because it shows that the dinosaurs, they lived in an environment different from what we live in, where yeah. there's a night-day temperature that's... Mm. They lived in a... Balmy. Balmy, wonderful evening cools off just a little bit, warms mm -hmm. up in the morning, but not too hot, and so on and so forth. Just a wonderful, even temperature. Yeah. It completely obliterates so many of the arguments about dinosaurs, you know, I mean, the hot-blooded business and all that. Yeah, that's right. You don't need any of that. No. If the, if the temperature variation is only 5 degrees Celsius between night and day, and through the year, who cares? You yes. know, whether you're hot. And, and also, but, but they're also immersed in water anyway. That's right. Yeah, the, and that's even more cells. stabilizing. Yeah. 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 So it buffers them. Here we go. All right. We're going to win, aren't we? We are, we are. There's no problem about that. Of course we're going to win. These digital animations recreate the skeletons of the very biggest of the sauropods, Argentinosaurus. The University of Manchester team scanned the dinosaur's skeleton and mapped its muscles onto its bones. This animal is so big, it's right at the limit of what you can cope with as a, an animal that lives on land. And things like getting up off the ground would have been extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, on land. This, and things like getting this up is off a man the ground would who have been believes dinosaurs were terrestrial, as all these childish, simple-minded paleontologists do. And what is he saying? He is saying that even standing up would have been virtually impossible. And this is from a man who believes in it. No, ladies and gentlemen. The evolution of gigantism is only possible, never explained by dinosaurs being terrestrial. Nor is the counterbalancing tale or the paradox of their fossilised footprints. It doesn't explain how they were said to be dynamic, it doesn't explain how they could copulate, which would be impossible on land, or how they could overcome your. It says nothing about warm or cold blood, the sense organs on their faces, what the gastrinium is for, how they became extinct or how we might rethink the Cretaceous climate. The new theory I'm giving you tonight, the aquatic dinosaur theory, answers every one. Explains why they're gigantic, it does away with the counterbalance, explains the footprints, the dynamism, how they copulated, how they overcame the physics of yore, how they had their temperature regulated by their environment and not from inside, why they had sensory organs living in water, what the gas gradient was for, why they became extinct, and how we could remodel the Cretaceous climate. No, ladies and gentlemen, the notion that we've all been conned into by these simple-minded souls of these unfeasible monsters pounding about on the ground is a nonsense. This is what we now need to do away with. No dinosaur ever, ever behaved like that. It is absolute rubbish. Look at Eleanor's gorgeous drawing, Eleanor Kish, born in America, died at 102 as a Canadian citizen. That's a wonderful painting, it's so vivid. This is bigger than a bloody elephant. It may have staggered about, ladies and gentlemen, when it lurched from the swamps in order to come and lay its eggs, but it was aquatic. It never lived on land. The Tyrannosaur, which you look at here, is front heavy. It couldn't stand. It would fall immediately on its chin. It has lost the use of its forelimbs because, being aquatic, it didn't need to have four legs to support its massive weight. And if we introduce this watery environment, then suddenly it makes sense. It is buoyant, it is stable, it's in equilibrium, and it can move anywhere it wants at the drop of a hat. This evening, ladies and gentlemen, we are seeing the end 
of the tyranny of the terrestrial dinosaur and the dawn of a new age where we all understand that dinosaurs actually evolved in water. I want to thank all the artists, of course. I want to thank the paleontologists who've given me such enormous enjoyment with their trivialities and their naivety. And I want you to understand that you mustn't breathe a word of this outside this room tonight. The book comes out on the 31st of May, and that is when your friends must get their sleeping bags and encamp in the doorway waiting for Waterstones to open at 7 o'clock. But believe me, ladies and gentlemen, dinosaurs never were terrestrial. They always were aquatic. The old theory is dead, and my new one can now take over. Thank you very much.